Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. It's the Ukraine War news update, second part thereof, third part thereof, whatever part thereof, for the 21st of September 2024. We're going to start with, I thought this was going to be a quick one and I could join it up with the geopolitical video, but actually there's quite a lot more stuff that I have found out is taking place. Um, we're going to start with what's been widely reported concerning the US restrictions on Western weapons speaking to benny pie yesterday who does the atp distilled uh, ai summaries of my videos and he's testing out a new thing that has been produced by google a new form of ai stuff that can do absolutely freaking amazing things and he's pumped in a load of articles concerning storm shadow and he's got it to basically put all of that information into like a notebook in, into just summary. You can summarize it, ask it different questions like, you know, what are the issues with exporting Storm Shadows between 20, uh, 2000 and 2020 or whatever? And it can just summarize. It's just absolutely amazing. And he was just showing me this. And this is an incredible tool for research. It's just absolutely amazing. And I'm going to see if he can send me his, his latest understanding. But he was uh, saying that actually there are some really interesting things with regard to Storm Shadow and why it might be that they... Because lots of people have been talking about ITAR, which is basically the ability to export um, weapons, given that weapons might have components from other countries, etc., etc. And there was... There are rumours that the US are not allowing UK Storm Shadows or French Scalp EGs to be used because of components inside and blah, 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 rather than it being a UK weapon and we've given permission, but the US is blackmailing, saying, yep, you've given them permission, you've given Ukraine permission to use these weapons, but Ukraine, if you use those weapons, you can do that, fair enough, that it's not like illegal or anything given export issues but if you do use them we won't give you help over here right so there are two different things going on so what is it is it like an anti-escalation thing through and and thus blackmail or is it actually export restrictions on there and there could be some interesting things about export restrictions that that he's found out uh, so anyway i will i will get the latest from him but i think there are several reasons why it might be that the us is involved in restricting ukrainian use of what otherwise look like uk and european missiles okay that aside the Times reports that the US and the UK are in secret talks to approve the use of Western weapons for strikes deep inside Russia. This decision will remain confidential and will only be officially confirmed after Ukraine's first strikes on Russia. Now, I hinted at that previously, uh, but this has now been quite widely reported in, an, in a number of different places. So, for example, uh, LBC saying the U US and UK are preparing to give the nod in private with a change in position confirmed only after the first missiles have been fired. U US is keen to see a plan uh, first from Zelensky on how it could help see them through the winter months of the war. A final decision could be rubber stamped as soon as the UN General Assembly next week, the meeting next week. Now... There has been this plan, this victory plan that Zelensky and his team have put together. They've given that to Americans. I don't know how far down that goes in terms of who gets to see that, whether it's like Senate intelligence committees or all senators or all you know representatives or just a few people at the top, whatever. But he has provided that victory plan to the US and I presume others that it, it, it appears from early reactions that it seems to be a fairly decent enough victory plan. I don't know, as I said this morning, whether the strikes on these ammunition depots are part of that, as if to say, look what we can do. Here's a victory plan. And bish, bash, bosh, bang, 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 kaboom. Look what we can do, right? If you give us storm shadows, we can do that at this place and this place and this place because I think they've also given a list of sites that can be hit as well and it's like look what we've done with these drones and maybe Neptune missiles not too sure but but if you are impressed with that here's our plan allow us to use these storm shadows and these whatever else that the US might even give on top of what and, and we'll talk about this in a little while the the JASMs and the JSOWs uh, these other missiles that the F-16s could fire, if we can use them as well, then we could hit here, 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 here. So 
it's it's it looking better, but it's not ideal because obviously it would have been nice had, had they been able to use them already. Now on that kind of in that context, Michael Carpenter from the Biden administration has said, quote, President Biden is absolutely determined to support Ukraine and put it in the strongest position at the end of his term in office. So he's this lame duck uh, president at the moment that is supposedly concentrating on the Middle East. And although, goodness me, that's a, that's a real hot potato at the moment. And Ukraine, although we haven't, you know, with this rumbling restriction issue, I, I don't know that it's o overly obvious that he's spending the time that he said he was going to on Ukraine and the Middle East. At the same time, the campaign is in full swing and there's so much work to be done on a campaign and he's going to be rolled out in places like Pennsylvania, which is super, super important. Anyway, apparently he he says, well, Michael Carpenter says of him, and he has directed all of us to make sure we provide that we provide all, especially military assistance and security assistance. So, it appears that that's the right rhetoric. They're going to be trying to do X, Y, and Z for Ukraine. But let's see that actually have tangible effect. Okay, then we move on to this. So new news in. In a first, the US will likely send Ukraine a joint standoff weapon for the F-16s. It's a precision missile that can travel around 70 miles. It's part of the $375 million package expected to be announced on Monday. So we look forward to that on Monday. Wonder what will be on that package of equipment. Remember, there's about $6 billion worth of presidential drawdown that needs to be used by September the 30th. It's now September the 21st. If the Congress can't extend that, then there might be a bit of trouble. So there might be trying to just expedite through a bunch of packages and it might be that a bunch of these packages might not be for now but like we'll just uh, pledge these things and then at a later point you know those packages will be put together but this one looks more like imminent anyway quote the US is considering sending uh, Ukraine a medium range missile the joint standoff weapon for its new F-16 fleet as part of a 375 million aid package to be announced on Wednesday said Politico sorry to repeat myself there now the um the joint standoff weapon looks like this. Now it calls it a glide bomb in this uh, Wikipedia page, but um, yeah, the AGM-154 joint standoff weapon, JSOW, is a glide bomb that resulted from a joint venture between the US Navy and Air Force to deploy a standardized medium range precision guided weapon, especially for engagement of defended targets from outside the range of standard anti-aircraft defenses, thereby increasing aircraft survivability and minimizing friendly losses. It's intended to be used against soft targets such as parked aircraft, trucks, armored personnel carriers and surface to air missile sites. So actually smaller, not quite the sort of thing you'd be hitting with, say the Storm Shadow cruise missile. And, and I presume, you know, there'll be a lot cheaper than those. As you can see here, unit cost, uh, depending on what variant, can go from 282,000 to 719,000. I'm fairly sure they get the the those other ones. The, sorry, the cheaper ones there. 70 miles, 130 kilometers. So it's a fair distance, 130 kilometers. That'd be very useful. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, see if control F, see if it mentions missiles. Uh, the designation of the joint standoff weapon as an air to ground missile is a misnomer as it is an unpowered bomb with guidance avionics similar to the older GBU 15. I don't know whether this is why. Was it Colby Badwell was saying that uh, journalists should do their uh, research and actually this isn't. So it, it, I, I sort of half read a tweet. He was, he's having a right go at journalists reporting on this and it could be the fact that they've called it a missile and it isn't actually a missile, it's a bomb. Um, and that is that pretty much uh, sums it up there. Interestingly, the GBU, it talks about the older, similar to the older GBU-15. You've got the GBU-39, which is the guided glide bomb guided glide bomb that they're using at the moment in quite, to quite some effect. Um, GBU-39, small diameter bomb. And that is, yeah, guided glide bomb, similar, 250 pound, 110 kilogram precision guided glide bomb. Uh, yeah, so that's what they're using quite, quite a lot at the moment so is this i mean the warhead is um a yeah okay well 
I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look at that. At um, well, it does have a bro brooch multi-stage warhead on on a, a newer variant, a JSOWC. So the brooch multi-stage warhead is what's used on the the Storm Shadow, and indeed the Taurus has has uh, this as well. I don't, it's not exactly the same, I think, on the Taurus. But the Storm Shadow has an initial explosion that blows apart, say, the concrete of a bunker, so that it can get down into the bunker and then a secondary explosion takes place so it's like a two-stage explosion so that you can definitely well m more probably destroy what's deep inside whatever you're trying to hit so that's why they're called bunker busters so it's interesting that some of these jsow's have bunker busting capabilities to some degree um interesting we'll have to um we'll have to see what's given to to ukraine right okay now, here, talking about Colby Bad Boy, here's something that makes very little sense to me, but I'm sure you'll make sense of it, somebody with the expertise. Uh, the Department of Defense has awarded Advanced Navigation and Positioning Corps, so a company, a $13.8 million Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, USAI. So this is when you've got all this money and you've got to, there are different ways of spending it. So some of it will be presidential draw drawdown authority. You take it for, you take equipment from US stocks that's already been bought and paid for. You give it book value. So you say, here's $100 million worth of kit. It's actually worth kind of nothing in a sense, unless you're going to sell it. it so the, there's an opportunity cost maybe of, of giving that, but then you put book value on it. So look, we give them $100 million worth of kit, but actually you know, it's been bought and paid for. That's different from USAI, which is let's put an order into a US company. So we actually have to pay that money, pay that money out. That US company gets that money. We get some back in tax revenue and people who have jobs and then money multiply, et cetera, et cetera. And then that equipment gets sent to Ukraine. So it's an order for them. And that's what this would be for two transportable transponder instrument landing systems with associated connex and trailers 12 months spare part kits drone calibration and an option for training this is in support of ukraine's f-16 fleets brilliant excellent sounds great no idea what all of that means um so some somebody i'm sure can explain to me that but it, it seems like a, okay it's not the biggest contract but 13.8 million is a size of, i mean i said biggest contract when you're looking at the cost of patriots and patriot missiles etc etc but some support there for f-16 fleets uh the that that the ukrainians are going to be utilizing starting to utilize the u.s has also announced a one million dollar um, has announced $1 million to protect Ukrainian cultural heritage, according to the ICCC. The Sustainable Heritage Project will last for 30 months and will improve coordination between Ukrainian institutions and heritage pr preservationists. In the total, the US has allocated $7 million to preserve Ukraine's heritage. It was interesting, Ukraine, the latest podcast segment on this kind of stuff the other day and about how it, actually they had a whole section where they were interviewing an archaeologist who was saying we've got all these sites in Crimea and the Russians since since 2014 have gone into Crimea and they basically looks like they disappeared a load of the artifacts they, there's something like I forget what it is like a million artifacts or something like 700 I can't remember what the number is just a vast number of artifacts that they think have gone missing but basically been stolen from these cultural sites and taken back to Russia and it's just yeah, cultural um a cultural heist of sorts really it's it's terribly sad um, okay, Zelensky will visit the Scranton Army Ammunition Plant tomorrow uh, uh, with Undersecretary of Defence for Acquisition and Sustainment, Laplante. Laplante's been really heavily involved in, in assistance to Ukraine. Um, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology, Bush, he, likewise him. And Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. So Josh Shapiro is a guy that was possibly going to be the Vice Presidential Nick for Kamala Harris. He wasn't, it was Tim Wells, but actually he's... Um, the governor of Pennsylvania and Scranton in Pennsylvania, which is where Joe Biden's from. So, you know, Joe from Scranton. It's, Pennsylvania has seen a lot of money coming in from aid going to Ukraine because of the, particularly here, the ammunition manufacturing plant that is producing an absolute ton of 155 mil shells. Really important uh, site, this. And they've ramped up, successfully ramped up here as they have all over the US in terms of their manufacturing capacity for these shells. Zelensky will thank factory workers who produce shell bodies for 155mm artillery ammunition. That is an awesome bit of PR. 
and imagine Zelensky going around, imagine you are working at that plant, you are not going to be, you're almost certainly not going to be someone who's pouring scorn on support for Ukraine, right? If you're working in that factory uh, and you know what you're doing it for and you've probably had it, you probably understand the situation far more than your average Joe, uh, average Joe, uh, on the American streets. And so I think that's just really nice. And of course, you say, oh, I've met Zelensky. This is really good. I understand this. And then you, you talk to your friends, your friends talk to friends. And it's like spreading this, the information and, and uh, about why it's important that US support Ukraine and how they support Ukraine and how that money is spent, et cetera, et cetera. It's not taking money out of the bank and throwing it in Zelensky's face. You know, it's, it's investing in the US, ramping up capacity that all will also help the US. In, in a time of need. So Norway has allocated an additional $5.7 billion to Ukraine until 2030. So this is spread over time. You, Norway were the first... Norway had already said this previously. I, I don't know if this is an updated version of it. But they were one of the first nations to say, we are going to ring fence support for you on an ongoing basis. This will be chronic support for Ukraine so that we send a signal to Putin that we're in this for the long haul and you think you can outlast the West, but actually we've kind of contractually obliged ourselves as Norway, for example, to help Ukraine until this until this year, until 2030. And then the EU have done similar things and other nations have picked up on this. But Norway were, were ahead of the game there. So Norway's civil and military support program for Ukraine, known as the Nansen program, will be extended until 2030. So I think they've obviously taken out an idea and extended it and will be increased by a further 5 billion krona, $475 million this year. Oslo announced on September the 20th. That's really good. I know that Stephen Bendal and other Norwegians have said, look, I'm, I'm kind of upset that Norway isn't doing enough. But I, Norway probably, I don't know, maybe well justified in your opinion. You're, Nor you're Norwegian, you know far more than I do on this. But I think Norway and all the Nordic and Baltic nations are really like leading the way in how they are helping Ukraine. And this is a really good sign, um, not just more this year, but it's an ongoing basis. And also just, you know, you've got Sweden and Finland joining NATO. It's just, it's all helping in really significant ways, right? Norwegian government here has proposed an increase for, for support to Ukraine this year, 430 mil, and to provide at least 1.3 billion per year until 2030. So that, that was, I've included that one because it gives you the yearly basis, the yearly total. So 1.3 billion per year. Now that's really significant given the size of Norway, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of population GDP. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, you might think 1.3 billion like US provided 12, uh, sorry, 61 billion. Actually, when you look at military aid, that's only 25, not only, but it's 25 billion out of the 60 billion was actually military aid. And you know, when you compare GDPs and population sizes, uh, when you've got you know, Norway, I don't know what the population of Norway is, but it's going to be uh, max 10 million, isn't it? And when you've got 350 million of US, uh, Norway pop population sorry to do this live i should have um no that's not not right norway population um it's five point well there you go sorry even even less so you you know you divide that that's that's the goodness me so to provide that amount of money every year so if you if you do um let's i'm going to do the maths here uh probably not live with you though so here we go. So 5.46 million is just on population, but of course GDP is really what we want to be uh, tracking. But in terms of population, US has 333, uh, Norway 5.46. 5 so what we need to do is multiply that 1.3 billion per year by 60.54. Um, that's how that's how much bigger the US population is. So times. Um, uh, 1.3 and that's equivalent to Norway just on a population level giving 70 uh, basically 79 billion so in other words Norway have every year um, obliged themselves to give more than the US has in kind of per capita right uh, now let's let's have a look at um, GDP now looking at the GDP uh, Norway's GDP is actually pretty good for its for the size of its population. That's because of its oil reserves and sovereign wealth fund, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Four hundred eighty-five billion, um, and the US GDP in twenty twenty-three was twenty-seven point three six trillion. So that's about uh, what I work it out 
it, it is about 56.35 times bigger. In other words, if we took 1.3 billion and multiplied that by um, uh, by 50, um, 56.35, then you get 73.25. So on both metrics, Norway, sorry to belabor the point, but it's, when we look at, say, Norway saying, we're going to do this, and you think, oh, yeah, that's really good, whatever. Okay, well done, Norway. And we, we can like take that for granted and say, well, Norway have done 1.3 billion per year. Pfft, yeah, okay, well, the US has given... 61 billion dollars well actually this is kind of this is military aid by the looks of it and so we're not possibly not comparing apples to apples i i don't know i i presume this is just military aid and even if you assumed that the us gave 61 billion dollars of military aid that's still not as much as norway either worked out per capita or on gdp and so we should actually be looking at news like this from norway and go Bloody hell, Norway, that's really, really good. For a country of 5.46 million people, you have got or you have given and you are pledging to give until 2030 the equivalent of the US giving $75 billion every single year until 2030. That is no small thing. So sorry to belabor that and, and go through some rudimentary, pretty rubbish maths on my part. Had to get a calculator in the end. Um, I think I think that's important. So awesome, Norway. Thanks. Uh, German arms manufacturing giant Rheinmetall has successfully tested its Skyranger 35 air defense system on the Leopard 1 tank chassis. Seen here firing a stream of 35mm shells at proving ground, Rheinmetall appears to be moving towards fielding a new, lower-cost, self-propelled anti-aircraft gun. So that's really good news because you need things like that. We need to, we've need we reverted back to needing stuff like this because of the threat of drones. So it's, before it was like, yeah, the Gepards were being phased out as obsolete and you want things like Patriots. Uh, but now we're like, yeah, you, you know, we're using a Patriot against a, a Shahid drone, right? Now, um, we have some Danish awesomeness here. The first $40.7 million or euros, sorry, from Denmark for direct financing of Ukrainian defense production are already in Ukrainian defense accounts. Crucial step to strengthening our defense capabilities. More to come. Thank you, my friend. Uh, troll, uh, that's uh, Paulson, uh, Troll Lund. Lund Troves Lund Poulsen, the defense um, chappy from Denmark. Now, I think that is in the context of paying for Bogdana self propelled guns, and we talked about that previously. Now, in terms of funding, there was this huge loan that Ursula von der Leyen from the EU has secured for, or not her personally, but the EU has secured for Ukraine based on frozen Russian assets and I was like I don't quite know how the loan works I'm sure someone will help me out so someone said it's a loan it's securitization the cash flows from the frozen funds are used to create a loan the interest payments on the loan are broadly matching the cash flows on the frozen assets the loan can be structured as a perpetual instrument it can have uh, a call feature whereby if the assets are seized or Russia agrees to pay the principal or pay Ukraine damages which they can use to repay the loan thank you James Haas here who uh, has given me that answer. I really appreciate that. Uh, this was put even more simply in, Ukraine will not repay a new loan of 35 billion euros from the EU, according to the Ministry of Finance. A loan will be repaid exclusively at the expense of future profits from the frozen Russian assets in the EU. That appears to be what has been announced. So that's really good because loan sounds like... Uh, the, Ukraine are going to have to pay that back with interest, etc., etc. But actually, it's been set up in such a way that that it looks like the EU is giving the loan and paying themselves back off uh, the frozen Russian assets profits. Uh, excellent stuff. Head of the Center for Countering Disinformation of Ukraine, Andriy Kovalenko, has commented on Russia's statement about the increase in the production of Shahid, so the one-way attack drones that the Russians use and now producing themselves. They originally procured them from Iran. I don't know if they still are getting them from Iran as well as building them. Now, quote, they are almost shifting to a 24-7 attack mode in the future, making air raid alerts a constant occurrence in some regions. Now, this is super important. I've been worrying about this. In fact, I, I have spoken to you about how the production of these must be at such a level that it's allowing Russia to attack Ukraine so consistently and so, so 
with such numbers that it's deeply worrying. Now, Ukraine, Ukraine has done an amazing job of intercepting these. Most nights at the moment, we're getting around 100% interception or electronic warfare uh, success rates. But you're thinking, goodness me, you know, are they just finding a place that's weak and then are they going to pull into that? And you, you we're seeing 40 to 70 being released a night. Now, last night was a different a different night. It was there were only 16 sent into Ukraine. And I don't know if they've exhausted their supplies or whether it's just uh, just a random low night. And we'll get back to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 drones being sent every night. This is a real challenge for Ukraine and they need to, like we've seen them strike those ammunition depots, I would say Shahid drone manufacturing facilities got to be one of the top targets at the moment for the Ukrainians. Now, it, this is totally worrying because I can imagine this would be psychologically really horrific. I don't want to suggest you, Russia do things here, but imagine instead of sending 70 drones in a wave at night, they send, they divide that by 24 hours and you send those drones every hour of every day that so that no one ever gets a rest from air raid sirens and it would just be exhausting for the Ukrainians. They, they send them all at night, but obviously they're more protected at night, right? So that's why they do it through the night, but quite often they do it most, most of the time throughout the night. Um... And maybe it's just too risky to do it in a day. They'll just get far more of them shot down. Uh, but it's the idea that they're producing enough of these potentially to just have 24-7 attack modes where where they are just sending them continually into, into Ukraine and Ukraine just gets ground down psychologically. Um, but according to him, this game can be played by two people and there's a key. Of course, Ukraine is supposedly manufacturing these attack drones that they have at the same rates as the Russians. That's what the claim was from the Ukrainians previously. I don't know that we've yet seen that, especially with this uptick in Russian usage recently. But then you look at the last week and you see 100 drones used last night. Uh, 101 and that's what the russians are claiming remember so it's much more likely that there was 150 maybe more drones i, I don't know the russians claim 101 that's going to be your benchmark minimum three nights ago you had uh, arguably 100 drones used at one location so actually it could be the, the ukrainians can play that they can play that game now as well and so if the Russians try something horrible out on Ukraine, Ukraine has the ability to replicate that. And uh, uh, yeah, Anton Gerashenko says of the Russians, 14 Ghanaians were tricked into traveling to Russia and forced to sign contracts with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Now they are being held in Donetsk and threatened to be sent into combat, according to three news and Ghana web. 11 of them have already disappeared without a trace. 14 men left Ghana for let, uh, for Russia on August 4th, 2024, to, as they thought, quote, earn money in agriculture or security work, the publications reported, citing the men themselves. Quote, they were lured with promises of securing a well-paid job in Russia, but hopes of building a better future immediately faded after they were confronted with reality on the ground upon their arrival in Russia on August the 6th, said Garner Webb news um immediately after arriving in the Russian Federation, the men were taken to Kostroma and given to sign labor contracts. Uh, however, to their utter shock, it turned out to be an agreement on recruitment into the Russian army to fight against Ukraine. After that, the men were transported to Donetsk. In a video published by the media, one of the Ghanaians says that the men were deceived by a guide, Abraham Boakye, whom they trusted. He also told them to sign contracts with the Russian Defence Ministry, but since the Ghanaians do not know Russian, they did not realise they were signing military contracts. The men also had their passports confiscated. You can't go, Ed, quote, you can't go, get out any, go out anywhere, even if you are going to private the military follows you one Ghanaian said in a video from Donetsk where foreign nationals are now reportedly being held of the 14 Ghanaians who left Ghana for the Russian Federation just over a month ago the fate of only three of them is now known the rest are missing local journalists report we have quote we have no fighting experience we're pleading we want to return home please help us we are sleeping on plywood and it is so uncomfortable, the Ghanaians said. Ghana Web, uh, sorry, Ghana Web writes that it contacted the Russian embassy in Ghana but received no response. Again, um, like I always say, what does this represent? What does this predict? What, what is this predictive of? What is this reflective of? 
You know, is this a Russia that has no problem with recruiting? Is this a Russia that is desperate to recruit anyone but Russians for fear of losing popular support for the war, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, uh, and then on top of that, we have a, a news piece here that says Russians from a mechanized battalion uh, have, have, sorry, Russians have formed a mechanized battalion from the crew of the Kuznetsov aircraft carrier and the Kuznetsov is famous because it's I think it's the only Russian aircraft carrier and it has been fixed up in um in a naval base and it it has been it you know due to be fixed up for a number of years and I think the latest is it's going to be until what is it 2030 or something like this is an absolute disaster of an aircraft carrier and it is not seaworthy at the moment and doesn't look like it's going to be seaworthy for an awful long time so on the one hand, you're like, well, you've got a bunch of sailors that have been trained up for that vessel and they're twiddling their thumbs. But normally you would just go and move them across to another vessel and then you wouldn't be recruiting as many people into the Navy. But because the Russians are so desperate for infantry, for these meat assaults, for their, their assaults across the front line, they have fought, they're forming a mechanized battalion from the crew of that aircraft car carrier, according to the Ukrainians. So, uh, wow. So, yeah, the cruiser went under overhaul in 2017 after an operation on Syria, Syrian coast in October 2018. It was leaving the PD-50 shipyard of the 82nd Rosilkovo shipyard, and then it began to sink. The accident caused the crane to fall onto the cruiser's deck and damage it. It's an aircraft carrier. Uh, the ship's repairs continued, but a year later, a large-scale fire broke out on the Admiral Kuznetsov. At least six people were injured. The ship was supposed to be repaired until 2024, but it is likely to continue. Uh, and so that's what I reported more recently because it's been extended that as well. Um, okay. And then just, I, I missed sharing this with you earlier. It's concerning, you know, we talk about military aid, about military production, military equipment storage. We have seen, the, and this is based on the strike on the Toropets ammunition depot from three nights ago, not the, the ones that took place last night. This is the UK intelligence update from this morning, but it won't be referring to last night's activities. So overnight on the 17th and 18th of September 2024, Ukraine conducted a successful one-way attack, uh, un, uh, a successful one-way attack uncrewed aerial vehicle strike. So attack drone strike on Toropet's strategic ammunition depot in Russia's Tver region, approximately 500 kilometers from Ukraine. The depot is a storage site of the 107,000 on the Russian main missile and artillery directorate, and almost certainly housed munitions of varying calibers for frontline use, as well as missiles and glide bombs used by nearby airfields. So, um, yeah, not just, uh, you know, pertaining to artillery or, or rockets. And th these are potentially ammunition depots that that house the 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 scourge of the ukrainians these guided glide bonds potentially ammunition procured from north korea was also reportedly stored here renovated in 2018 is one of russia's largest strategic ammunition depots directly supporting its operation in ukraine storing more than 30 30 000 tons of ordnance recent improvements to the site had been driven by previous poor storage of aging explosive material leading to a series of explosions across several depots one such explosion in june 2011 in pugachevo udmercia saw 3,000 homes damaged and 30,000 people evacuated. The explosion at Torre Pets was recorded at 2.7 on the Richter scale, equivalent to a mild earthquake, with fires covering a 6 kilometer wide area. It is highly likely that poor storage of munitions left vulnerable to one-way attack drones caused a chain reaction of cascading detonations within the bunker system, resulting in enormous loss of ordnance. Russian air defense continues to struggle with Ukrainian deep strike operations, despite claiming to have intercepted over more than 50 drones in this attack. Although part of a wider supply network this loss will highly likely disrupt russian ground operations particularly in the kursk region okay so not a great amount of detail about what might have been destroyed you know granular detail and how much it will affect i mean this is serious and those two strikes last night will have been will have really serious ramifications and it's going to be interesting to see if we can recognize this in in any way on the front line whether there'll be a lack of a certain type of activity taking place, whether it be artillery or MLRS or fewer carb bombs and aviation strikes. You know, it'd be interesting to see if, if there's any data that will support Russia having an issue with these three sites being struck. And also we might expect to see 
the Ukrainians strike other depots to add to the Russian woes in terms of their um, ordnance stockpiles. Anyway, that's enough from me. Hopefully that was of use for you. The last thing I'm going to say, and this is a bit of a message to any mods out there that might be still helping out, uh, there's a new phenomenon that, that has certainly hit my uh, my threads over the last few weeks and it is this and I, I was speaking again to Benny Pye yesterday and he's like unsure he did some research though uh, the the advice is to kind of delete or block these but there are loads and loads of comments on the threads and they seem really benign or, or kind of not even benign they seem really kind of irrelevant and neutral where where it looks like bots are writing out names of people, surnames or first names and different ones. Lee, Helen, Martinez, Daniel, Miller, Karen. Loads of stuff like that. Uh, it is almost certainly trying to game the system in some way, maybe seeing innocuous, maybe diluting comment threads, maybe getting a foot in with loads of comments that aren't deemed as problematic. And then every like tenth comment writing something that's really proper um propagandistic or spammy or whatever so just for any moderators out there hide the user from channels what i'm doing or delete them just do something to get rid of these because they certainly aren't um they're certainly not good news they might be innocuous now but it's planning on something later so we're seeing loads of these just names 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 and then often like that same account will post like three times in almost in a row different names uh, just delete them if you can. Okay, thank you very much for, for listening to this. Take care, everybody, and speak to you soon.